Hey, good morning, Aggieville Baptist Church. Hope everyone is doing well. I wanted to take some time this morning and try to answer a question that I've received multiple times over the last couple months. And the question goes something like this. What should the church do in light of these most recent shelter in place and uh, orders to stay at home and not get together as a fellowship of believers? What should the church do? How should we respond? Should we do what the government asks us to do? And listen, it's a really, it's a really good question, and it's a really important question. And, and as Christians, we need to know the answer to this and know exactly what God expects from us. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look through God's Word to try to answer this question. Because I've heard it said by some that maybe we should disobey those in authority. Disobey those um, government officials in an attempt to defend our religious freedom and defend our religious liberties. Or, uh, or we should assemble as Christians to raise up a well-spoken and an authoritative Christian man or woman to stand up for us in, in maybe Congress or the courts or even, even the office of president. And the thought is if we can only get just a, a good Christian as the head of our government, then all of our problems would be solved. Yet this morning, I'm not quite sure that that is the answer to our problems. These solutions may sound patriotic, or they may sound reasonable, or they may sound like the American thing to do. Um, however, as Christians, we've got to think more in line of who we are as Christians and, and who we represent, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to think along the lines of the fact that we are ultimately citizens of heaven, the Bible says. And when we think about these solutions of raising someone up in government or maybe disobeying those in authority and to defend our religious freedoms, ultimately these end up being non-biblical. And my fear is that as Christians, we're looking past Jesus Christ as our security and we're looking for an earthly figure or someone in the government who looks like us and who can save us. And could it be that we're doing this to such an extent that we're ruining our Christian witness and pushing against the will of God? In fact, this is not an uncommon thought of people. Um, we only have to go back as far as the Jewish uh, religious leaders and even the disciples who were following Jesus at the time when he was on this earth. And what they were looking for in a Savior was not that of Jesus. Instead, they were looking for a Savior who was of like-minded political views and, and who thought like them religiously. They were looking for a figure who would free them from the tyranny of the opposing Roman government and the opposing Roman worldview. And I, I got to thinking about that today. That sounds quite a lot like us. So this morning, to try to figure out how God would like us to respond to this, I want to point your attention to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 11 through 17 this morning. And unlike several week ago, weeks ago when I told you, hey, this is going to be a short and sweet message, this one's going to be a little longer, but I, I ask that you hang in there. Um, you hang in there with me because I really think that it's going to be worth it. Uh, we need to hear from God on this. We need to hear in His own words what's found in the Bible as to how to answer the question, how are we as Christians in the church to respond to these shelter-in-place orders mandated by the government? So as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, I start in verse 11. It says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of, so of the flesh, which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. 
For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, some may hear my message this morning and come to the conclusion that I'm encouraging Christians to just roll over, um, to give up, and just to give in. I Please don't misunderstand me this morning. That is not my intent. However, I'm, I'm challenging us this morning that we cannot formulate a response to these trying times without consulting the Word of God and seeing what God has to say about it. So, I want you to Look really closely here at verse 11 as we start out. Because in verse 11, Paul, I mean, Peter starts by saying, Beloved. So he's talking to Christians. He's talking to us. He's talking to Christians at that time. And he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Did you? Did you hear how God describes you and me and other Christians in this text? He says that we as Christians were sojourners. That's a fancy way of saying stranger. Um, only here for a short amount of time. He also says that we're exiles. That's a fancy way of saying, I guess, alien. And uh, you say, why alien? Well, we've heard a lot about alien and illegal alien in our news lately, and and the, and. And that term is used for somebody that comes from a, a foreign land who stays in a, in a land that's not their own for a while, but they, they retain their original citizenship. And he also says that we're strangers and, and we're that here only for a brief amount of time, all the while knowing that while where we're going is we're going to be home with the Lord. And this, this concept of sojourners and and strangers and citizenship is not unique just to this, this uh, letter written by Peter. In fact, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible, the book of Philippians, Paul writes to the church of Philippi, and he's encouraging these Christians who live in Philippi to, to, to say, hey, listen, hang in there. I know that you're not Roman citizens, but listen, you're, Ro you're citizens of heaven. And, uh, while you live there in Philippi, you must obey the laws of the Romans in Philippi. But you're not to worship the Emperor Caesar, of course. Instead, you're to endure the, endure the extreme persecution that you're facing. Obey the laws of the Romans in Philippi. But you are to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord. And brothers and sisters in Christ, it's the same today. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and he's your savior, you are in fact a citizen of heaven. And that means your, your home is in heaven. And eventually the Bible says that our home will be a new earth and a new heaven. Yet right now we live as an alien. We live as a, a stranger for a short amount of time here on this earth. And while we are not to worship our leaders while living here, uh, we're not to worship our kings, we're not to worship our presidents, our congressmen or congresswomen. We're not to worship our political leaders as saviors, as someone who can save us. But the Bible says that we are called by God to be subject to them. We are called to obey them. And I know it sounds crazy, especially if we feel like they don't have our best interests at heart sometimes, but it's true. And we can ask ourselves why, and the Bible actually tells us why here. And, and the answer is found in verse 13. It says, be subject. Why? For the Lord's sake. We do it because God tells us to do it. He says, be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Why are we to do it? It's because God has given them the ability to do it. Don't miss it. Where it says God sa uh, says that these authorities were sent by him. These authorities were sent by God. They're allowed to rule 
because God allows them to rule. We've got to trust that God is in control of all things and that the government institutions built by the hands of man, whether it be mayors, governors, Congress, the courts, or the president, these government institutions, they exist because God has allowed them to exist and that they actually do serve a purpose while we're here on this earth. But don't forget what what Jesus said to Pontius Pilate in the Gospel of John when when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate was kind of wielding his power over him, telling him how much authority that he had over Jesus. And, and Jesus said, listen, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. So as we go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, I want you to notice in verse 14 that these individuals in power, these folks that are in authority, They're supposed to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. And we know that's not always the case. And we know that these authorities are subject to sin, that they're subject to being hungry for power, and some will just do some awful things. But we as Christians are still to be subject to them. Why? For the Lord's sake. We are to live in this world, but the Bible says not to be of this world. We're not to partake in the sins of this world. In fact, it's by our conduct and our good deeds that we show unbelievers the way to God. Listen, by submitting ourselves, we don't lose our dignity. Yet we recognize the authority that God has given to these individuals. While the conduct and deeds of our leaders may be sinful... We as Christians are to abstain from that evil and to do what is good. We're to do what is right. We're to do what is just. We're to do that because it is the will of God. I mean, think about this. Peter, while he was writing this letter, was actually under the reign of the emperor Emperor Nero. He was a Roman emperor. And Nero was most likely the most wicked emperor to ever have lived. He may have even been the most wicked individual to ever step foot on this earth. The emperor Nero actually thought it was uh, good fun to light up the Roman streets at night with Christians. He covered them in tar. He lit them to be human torches while still alive. In fact, one historian summarized the everyday life of Christians under Nero's rule is being regularly covered with the skins of beasts, torn by dogs until they perish, nailed to crosses, or doomed to the flames and to be burnt, to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. So I got to thinking today, if anyone had a reason to write a letter to encourage his people to once and for all gather your swords, take to the streets, and rebel against the authorities, it would have been Peter. Instead, while living under Nero, Peter writes the direct opposite. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter looked to his brothers and sisters dying a a wicked death. And instead, he said, be subject to those who God has allowed to be in authority of us. Verse 15 and 16 provide the answer as to why we should be subject to those who are in authority. He says, for it is the will of God. And what is the will of God in this case? The will of God in this case, in, in, this pas- in these passages of scriptures, is that by doing good, as Christians, we should put to silence the ignorance and the foolishness of people. God is clearly telling us that ignorance and foolishness will always exist in this world. But we as Christians are called to do what is right, what is good, and what is just. To put to silence or to muzzle the ignorance and foolishness of people. We're to do good. And in this context, good means that we don't continually disobey and rebel against authorities. 
I read the other day the following uh, couple sentences, and I thought it was really pertinent for today's message. It says this, Yes, as Christians, we live in glass houses with our lives on display. But that being said, we should be distinctly Christian so that it serves to encourage others to follow our example, to follow Christ, and ultimately the example provided by the Word of God. Peter doesn't stop there. He continues into verse 16, and he says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living servants for God. I've caught myself saying this many times, and maybe you've caught yourself saying it too. I've said something like, I cannot let the government take away my freedom, my freedom of speech, my freedom of religion, freedom to bear arms, freedom to assemble, you name it. Because our country has fought so hard for these freedoms. Countless men and women have died for our country to have the freedoms that we have today. And we're all so grateful for those men and women. Yet let me, let me express this. Our life, our salvation, and our freedom as Christians, when, when Peter says to, to live as people who are free, our freedom as Christians is not determined by the freedoms afforded to us by the U.S. Constitution or the Bill of Rights or the many wars that we fought to retain them. Peter says to Christians, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. If tomorrow we woke up and found ourselves living in a socialist state or a communist state, and the U.S. Constitution the, or the Bill of Rights that we so desperately love were tossed into the trash can and, and not used anymore, we certainly would have lost, will have lost our rights as Americans. And our lives would look tremendously different. But brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you here this morning that your real citizenship, the Bible says, is in heaven. And you can never lose the real freedom. The freedom that means everything. The freedom from the penalty of sin that was given to you freely as a gift from our Lord and our Savior. Jesus Christ. Men, women, may take away all our other freedoms. Freedoms afforded to us through the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. But on the authority of Scripture, I can tell you today that your freedom from the penalty of sin can never be taken from you. And that's what Peter says, or means when he says, live as people who are free. Now, I, I need to certainly address one more uh, very important question that's asked when we talk about this topic. And the question goes something like this, but what if we as Christians are asked or demanded to do something that's in direct conflict with God's word? Are we supposed to do it? Since we're supposed to be subject to authorities who are in power? The answer to that is no. We're told by God in 1 Peter to submit to authority for the Lord's sake and to uphold the law of the land in which we live. We're told to do so as long as it does not force us as Christians to disobey God's laws, his commandments, or his words. You see, Peter and Paul, they didn't die because they led an opposition movement against authorities. They did not die because they opposed Nero and his wicked treatment of Christians. Peter, Paul, and other Christians at that time, they endured the persecution of those in power. And why did they do that? It's the court, because the Lord commanded them to do it, told them to do it. It was for the Lord's sake, Peter said. It was to glorify God. It was to accomplish his will. Instead, Peter and Paul, they did die. But they died for their commitment to preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter, Paul, and other Christians were killed because they refused to disobey God's laws and God's commandments. 
And what was it? What was the authorities? What did the authorities tell Peter, Paul, and the others to do that they said, no, 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 I can't do that? I can listen to you when you tell me not to walk down the street at 9 o'clock at night. I can listen to you when you tell me to do something I don't necessarily agree with, but listen, I'll do it because you're an authority over me. But what was it? What was it that made Peter, Paul, and the other disciples draw their line in the sand and say, we cannot go there? It's in Acts chapter 4, verses 19, and Acts chapter 5, verse 29, that we see Luke tell us that, what it is. It tells us that Peter and the other disciples were commanded by the ruling authorities to not speak or to not teach at all the name of Jesus. Clearly, this was a demand made by authorities that Peter and others, they just couldn't obey. This is where Peter, Paul, and the other disciples, they they drew their line in the sand. And the fact that they did that, they ended up paying for it with their lives. But notice, they didn't rally the troops. They didn't cause social disobedience. And the fact that they tried to usurp the power of the government or disobey in the sense of that they, um, they, they, they created a movement. Instead, they continued to preach the gospel until it cost them their lives because they knew that their citizenship was in heaven, that they were aliens, that they were strangers. They were here for only a short time but their citizenship was, is back in heaven and that they were going to go back to be home with their Lord. So should we as Christians who live in America work to protect our American freedoms? Absolutely we should. And should we try to elect Christian representatives in various offices of government to help protect our, religi- our religious freedoms? Most certainly. Most certainly. But I also want you to remember that these freedoms don't define us as Christians. There's men and women across the world right now who are Christians who do not have these freedoms, but they're still free. They're free because they're free from the penalty of sin. That freedom is what defines them as Christians, and that's what defines us as Christians today. So here's my answer to the original question, and I feel that it's, it's solidly rooted in Scripture. As of today, how are we as the church and how are we as Christians to respond when we're told by government authorities to stay at home for this season and to worship, at least through electronic means or maybe drive through churches, and we're doing it for the sake of keeping people from getting sick or spreading the virus? How are we to respond as Christians? How long is good enough? Well, the answer is that we as Christians are to do what they say. We're to stay at home and we're to worship. And while it may sadden us that other businesses were deemed essential, while the church was deemed non-essential, I don't want you to forget that we're still able to worship today. I'm still able to proclaim the the name and of Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior through this electronic means and to upload this to YouTube for the world to see. We are still able to preach and teach the Word of God. And while for us this type of church is not optimal, I'm so thankful that we're not yet at that point where Peter and Paul were, where the government authorities demanded them to stop preaching and teaching altogether. And while it certainly grieves us that our government authorities seem to be enjoying the power they're wielding at this time, we cannot forget, as Jesus said to Pilate, they would not have that power unless it was allowed from God above. So we have to trust God at this time, that he knows what he's doing and that he's in control. Yet, brothers and sisters in Christ, a day will come when we're told that we can no longer preach and teach the name of Jesus. Not just in the churches, but across electronic means as well. Any mention of Jesus at all will be met with a swift penalty from our authorities. 
And when this occurs, the Bible still does not give us any authority to take up weapons. It doesn't give us any authority to rally an army or to lead anti, anti-government movements. Instead, we're, we're provided an example after example in Scripture of men and women throughout the Bible who simply died for their faith. I say simply and in, in in, in a sense and not that it was not um, courageous, but they went about preaching and teaching the Word of God, even though it cost them their lives. They were willing to be jailed all while praising the Lord. No fanfare, no civil war, no storming the gates of the courthouses. Instead, while these actions may seem warranted and patriotic, they're just not biblical. Because remember, it is our it is by our conduct and our good deeds that we show unbelievers the way to God. In fact, it's it's, it's our obedience to those in authority that demonstrates our good works, that demonstrates that we are one and who, who understands authority that will maybe point an unbeliever to God. Maybe it's our willingness just to obey at this point that we may see more come to Christ. But let me finish by encouraging you today that our God has seen all of this coming. He's not surprised that we're all feeling a little uneasy during this time of uncertainty because he controls the future and he knows how it all ends. He controls it. And better yet, he wins. And if you're a brother or sister in Christ, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you win too. I say this to all Christians. For now, during this coronavirus pandemic, let's set the example for the rest of the world. Let's try our very best to follow the rules and guidelines given to us by those in the positions of authority. God says that by doing so, that we bring glory to him. Because if we don't, and as Christians, if we reject the authorities and we disregard their suggestions... Well, then we as Christians, we possibly run the risk of spreading the virus even more and putting our community at risk. And in fact, we put ourselves at risk of disobeying God's word. So I'm hopeful that we'll be back worshiping in our churches soon. I'm also hopeful that the rest of the world will look to us, Christians, as people who were the most willing to sacrifice for a season, to do what was right, and to protect the most medically fragile are, are those who are elderly so that our brothers and sisters or our neighbors would not get sick. But I'm most hopeful that our Lord God will be pleased with our willingness to listen and to respond to our authorities. Yet all the while, he'll see that we never stopped preaching and teaching his word. I love you, church. I thank God for you. And thank you for listening this morning. I pray that this has been um, helpful for you. I pray that you pray about it and and continue to read on in in 1 Peter. But just know that Jesus Christ, he is the reason that we have freedom. He is the reason that we have the freedom from our sins and the freedom from the penalty of our sins. I love you, church. Let us pray. Lord, thank you, God, for who you are and for being our God. I pray that you provide us an opportunity throughout the day today to think about your word here and for your spirit to testify to our spirit what is truth. Teach us, God, and and how we can be better at obeying those who are in authority over us. Father, show us how obedience is in accordance to your word, in accordance to your will. Father, what may be foolishness for men is truth for you. 
But Father, we want to follow the truth, that which is your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful day.